Praise the Lord God Almighty. For another blessed day he has created. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today has been a beautiful day. I got a chance to just minister to myself with the word of God and listen to different sermons throughout the day and allow the Holy Spirit to feed my spirit. I tell you, it's just been enriching to me today to just bask in the presence of the Lord. And I tell you, when God began to pour into us his revelation, knowledge, and understanding, it, it should change our mindsets and our attitudes and our hearts about the way we perceive things in life. It's been this song in my spirit all day, and we're going to a word of prayer in just a moment, but this song been in my spirit, if you miss me, from singing down here, come on up to bright glory. Amen. It says, if you miss me from singing down here, you can't find me nowhere. Come on up to bright glory. I'll be singing up there. If you miss me from shouting down here, you can't find me nowhere. Come on up to bright glory. I'll be shouting up there. I'll be shouting up there. I'll be shouting up there. Come on up to bright glory. I'll be shouting up there. If you miss me from praying down here and you can't find me nowhere, come on up to bright glory. I'll be praying up there. I'll be singing up there. I'll be shouting up there. Come on up to bright glory. I'll be singing up there. If you miss me from singing down here, you can't find me nowhere. Come on up to bright glory. I'll be singing up there. That was a preacher, old preacher that used to go to my dad's church when I was growing up, named Reverend Odell Clemens. That was one of his favorite songs he used to sing all the time to the church. And it was such a blessing just to hear him sing that song because he made a declaration, if you miss me from singing down here, come on up to bright glory, because that's where I'll be singing in the heavenly choir. I tell you, God is so amazing. When you begin to just bask in his presence, allow the Lord to fill your heart with such joy. You, you don't mind praising him. You don't mind giving God the acclimates that's do his awesome name because he's worthy. He woke you up to see another day. He allowed you to rest on last night, kept you from danger, seen and unseen. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises a standard against him. Amen. It's such an awesome experience to just be able to rest in God's presence, knowing that he's faithful and he's sovereign and he's holy. Amen. 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 There's another song he used to sing that really just blessed my spirit throughout the years. My mind is made up. When you get your mind made up, it doesn't matter what goes on around you, what's going on in your life. You're going to continue to give God the praise, the glory, and the honor. Amen. Amen. And the song, it says, my mind is made up. I'm on my way up. I got to hold my head up. I'm going on with the Lord. My mind is made up. I'm on my way up. I got to hold my head up. I'm going on with the Lord. Trouble in my way, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometime, I have to cry sometime. Trouble in my way, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometime, I have to cry sometime. I lay awake at night, I lay awake at night. But it's alright, it's alright. Cause I know Jesus, Jesus, he will fix it after a while, after a while. Amen. And you know, that's that's one of some old songs that you can sing in, in your, your moment where you're by yourself. You feel like depression trying to come.
come upon you, feel like you're being overwhelmed, feel like everything is going against you, you can always make your mind up that I'm going to praise the Lord anyhow. I can care less what the devil means for evil because God will call the work out for me good. Amen. So let's go into a word of prayer. We're going to get into our lesson tonight. I'm excited. I'm excited tonight what God is doing in the lesson tonight because of his goodness and his mercy, his grace, and his truth. We're back in our book again, Breaking the Threefold Demonic Cord of Jezebel. We, we're going to talk about this, uh, continue in, in chapter 5. We left off it. It says, How to discern and defeat the lies of Jezebel, Athaliah, and Delilah. We've been talking about Athaliah. We talked about Jezebel in the beginning. Now we talked about her daughter, how she became just as evil as her mother was and have the same influence of the enemy to control her life as well. So we're going to go into Delilah in the next chapter, but we're going to continue where we left off on last week. I mean, two weeks ago. I didn't make it last week because I had some things going on. I had a funeral that day. I had to repass out the word and get home to pretty late that evening. So I was tired. So I had to rest. But tonight we're going to pick up where we left off at. We're going to talk about defeating Goliath and Athaliah. Defeating Goliath and Athaliah. We talked about Athaliah, how she was just as evil uh, as her mother was to influence idolatry to the children of Israel. We talked about how this same wicked power has had such a, a strong influence to where it wants to destroy the righteous seed. So God wants us to know that now we're going to talk about God preserves the righteous seed. We were talking about, in the last couple of weeks, we, we were talking about how the enemy wanted to cut off the bloodline. The enemy wants to destroy legacies. He wants to destroy the future generations. And, and one thing about it, when you get a revelation of the influence of the enemy, you got to know how to defeat him in your own personal life. It's going to first start with you being surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, giving your life over to him, that he would have control in your life, do as he pleased in your life, and allow the word of God to minister to your heart. It's going to take you to get to a place of surrenders. Amen. So, Father, tonight we thank you for your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord God, for your, your presence to now, God. We pray, oh God, every distraction, every hindering spirit will be re rebuked by your spirit tonight, oh God. They'll be moved out the way. Everything the enemy tried to do to block you from getting your word out in the airways, God, tonight, we bind it in Jesus' name. We thank you, oh God, for free access to the airways to declare your word, oh God, that your people have ears to hear what the spirit says to the church. Be thou glorified. Be exalted now, oh God, as we humble ourselves for the mighty hand of God, that you would lift us up in due season. And I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, again, amen, again. Amen. So, we're going to get into our lesson now. We were talking about how Judah is a word for praise. Now, how, how Joseph blessed the 12 tribes of Israel in Genesis chapter 49. He, he blessed all the children that he had in his 12 tribes and how great they're going to be in the prophecy God has for them. He began to declare the word of God over his children. But the main one that stood out the most was Judah. Because that's of the lineage of David that will bring forth the Messiah. And the Messiah will come to bring salvation to the whole world. But then we talked about Herod. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, how King Herod was just like the same spirit of Jezebel, Athaliah, and Delilah. He wanted to cut off the generations of the male child to bring the Messiah. So he began to kill all the firstborn children, hoping he would kill the one who was called the Messiah. But God, I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God had a plan. God had a remedy to silence the voice of the enemy, to stop the enemy from attacking his son. He preserved his son for such a time as this. So it's up to you and I, my brother, my sister, to get a revelation, understanding of the word of God. And to walk in divine authority, walk in your purpose, walk in the will and the plan God has for you. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. If you hear any music, that's my neighbor next door blasting his TV. So excuse the noise. If you hear a lot of bass sound or whatever, just excuse it. So tonight we're going to talk about glory to God. This is going to be a good lesson. I, tell you, I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying myself studying this word and teaching this word because it's been encouraging me. It's been encouraging me to allow the Spirit of God to deal with my heart, 
to break the strongholds. To deal with my heart to remove the burdens that any place on my shoulders and the yoke off my neck. To allow the Spirit of God to strip me of the demonic influences of the enemy through the Jezebel spirit. Everybody in the body of Christ can be subjected to an evil spirit called Jezebel. Her daughter and her granddaughter are the same influencing spirits that band together make them so strong. That's why I call the threefold demonic cord. Because the threefold demonic cord has the power to imprison you in the state in your mind with a death structure. And God wants to let you know tonight that he has come and said it's free. You can be free because the word of God will give you the power to receive the Holy Spirit, the anointing, to break the chains and shackles off your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. God preserves a righteous seed. When you think about preserves, I remember growing up, my mother used to do do uh, preserve preservation, which would get strawberries, you chop them up, put sugar on them, put them in a bowl, put sugar on them, and let them get the marinade in the sugar. And then she would make jam out of it and put them in jars to preserve them. She did apples the same way. She did pears the same way to preserve some fruit. There would be a delicacy for us to eat at certain times when we want it with our meals. God does the same thing with our hearts. I talked about a couple of things ago how God, when he had told the parable of Jesus Christ about the sower, went forth to sow some seeds. The seeds had to be preserved in the soil in order to be productive. If you just have seeds sitting on the surface, it talks about how the birds come and eat the seeds. Some fell among thorns. Some fell on the wayside. But the soil that was rich received the seed and it began to go into the soil to produce fruit. God preserved the seed. He fed the seed. He nurtured the seed to bring forth a harvest in the lives of those who have ears to hear <coughs> what the Spirit says to the church. Glory to God, I tell you, when you begin to think about the seed, something is so minute, but yet so powerful. A seed is something that's so tiny sometimes, but yet God uses it to produce trees for nature, for the birds to nest in. He brings seeds to bring forth our vegetables, seeds to bring forth everything to sustain your life. But the problem comes in. We claim to know the word of God. But we neglect the word of God. So the seed. That was supposed to be planted. In you. When he gets to sprout a bud. He said just like planting corn. Here comes the, the bud. Then the stem. And then the harvest. When the, the seed is sown. And he gets to begin to nurture. And begin to grow. And bring forth a fruit. Or a stem. Or a vine. A little branch. Just like a tree. When you plant a tree. The tree begins to grow from that seed and sprouts up as a little bitty stem. But it continues to grow as you nurture it. Begins to marinate. Begins to manifest itself. Then it becomes a great tree when it grows real tall. Just like a grapevine. You can plant a grape seed in the ground and expect the harvest to come forth. But you don't nurture that thing. What's going to happen? It's going to wither in the soil. Become dry rock. And when it becomes the dry rot, the preservation for the seed has no power to keep it alive. But the Holy Spirit inside of us has the power to take the seed of the word that's planted in us to reserve that word to bring forth a harvest of blessing and favor upon our lives from the wisdom and knowledge of God's word. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But the problem comes in. We don't study our word. We don't spend time in prayer and fasting. We don't seek the faith of God. We get distracted with the things of the flesh. We soak into the television radios. We don't take time to allow God to fill us with his presence. God reserves a righteous seed. A righteous seed comes from what? From Jesus Christ. 
Because he is that righteous seed in us that bring forth life. If the seed of the word of God dies in you, you die spiritually. But God wants us to be aware of the tactics of the enemy through the Jezebel spirit, through Athaliah and Delilah, that you got the word of God inside of you. And it's up to you to allow the Holy Spirit to reserve that word. In other words, you got to study, you got to meditate, you got to spend time in God's presence, receiving wisdom and knowledge and understanding from the word of God. If I don't study the word of God, how can I teach somebody else how to live by God's word? I'm a hypocrite. I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. Because what I'm telling you to do, I'm not doing it myself. Because it don't apply to me. You got a lot of teachers in the body of Christ. A lot of preachers. A lot of prophets. A lot of evangelists. Missionaries. Apostles and prophets. All these different people that are of the body of Christ who teaches and preaches of what they learned in the past. Nothing relevant for today. They don't have no fresh rainbow word, no fresh revelation from the Holy Spirit. They are only stuck on the things of the past. So every time they have a conversation, every time they call themselves preaching, they are always talking about the past. You got to grow past the past. Grow past the past and allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse your mind from an evil conscience and be washed with clean water through the power of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. If we don't have a desire and a hunger and thirst for righteousness, how do you expect to be filled with the things of the world? Or with the fruit of the Spirit. With the power of God flowing in you. You have to make a decision. You know, I woke up this morning. And the Holy Spirit says. It's time to make a choice to do it over. And I thought about it all day. I was listening to different messages. I was spending time in God's presence. Feeding my spirit and. Learning how to not allow your feelings to get in the way. To Even when God allowed burdens to come into your heart. Some burdens God put on you to teach you to trust him. Some things God helped you bear. Some things God removed from you. But the problem comes in, in our minds. We look at all the negative stuff of what's going on. But we don't see God at work. Because I'm blinded by all the stuff. The Holy Spirit said it's time to make a choice to do over. And I said, okay, God, I hear you. Sometimes the old systems, the old cycles, of the way you've been living your life and doing the things you want to do in your life without the God's plan, God says it's time to do it over. Because now you need to incorporate the plan of God. You want to be blessed and have the favor of God? Incorporate the plan. Jeremiah 29, 11, God said, I know the thoughts and plans I have for you to prosper you and do you no harm. Do you expect your end and the future? God knows what he has deemed to be so in your life, even when the enemy. You know, I, I, I got a message God gave me. I'm going to preach it one day. Let's make a deal. I was talking with my pastor earlier today. I was conversing with him about let's make a deal. And he said, what scripture would you use with that? I said, well, the Spirit put in my spirit, St. Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tested of the enemy. Right? The enemy came with different opportunities to present to him a deal. Each time he said, let's make a deal. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He rebuked him. And then I thought about Job. When the enemy came to God and he says, let's make a deal. <laughs> he 
So I can take Job, who is upright and fears God, who loves God, and make him curse you to your face. He said, but I can't touch him because you got a hedge around him. You know what that hedge is? God's protection, God's barrier, God's border. You know how the Trump, Trump always talk about uh, closing the borders so the, so the immigrants can't come over? God has a spiritual border around your life where the enemy cannot cross over your border without you giving him permission. Did you catch what I just said? You give him permission. And as God begins to speak, the enemy says, let's make a deal. Then God says, okay, let's make a deal then. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll remove the hedge of protection from around Job. You can do anything you want to do to him. But don't touch his soul. In other words, you can't take his life. The enemy is every day plotting and planning for our demise so we can make a deal, an unrighteous deal. Because he knows the areas in your life that you haven't surrendered. Those strongholds, those bad habits, that foul mouth, that evil mindset, that weakness in your heart, he knows everything that he knows you know about yourself. And he comes when the opportunity is feasible to come into your life to present to you, let's make a deal. Glory to God. God preserves a righteous seed. God bless you all for tuning in tonight. Amen. In my recent book, Destiny Thieves, Destiny Thieves, let me put this on the screen. Give me one second. I'm gonna put this on the screen so you can follow me. Glory to God. This is this is gonna be good tonight, y'all. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Here we go. It says, <clears throat> excuse me. In my recent book, Destiny. Thieves. Let me do something here. One second. Hold on. One second, everybody. We're going to get into this. This is going to be a good one tonight. I hope you're hungry. I hope you're hungry and thirsty for God to fill you. Because He's going to fill you tonight. It says, I document more thoroughly the evil manipulation of Athaliah in securing her illegal access to the throne of Judah. Remember how she got the throne? The son died. And she didn't follow the protocol to become the next person in charge. She illegally seized the throne. Then she plotted to kill all the grandchildren so that there would be no descendant left in her bloodline to take the throne. Right? So now he says, in another book, you, you get a chance, look at that book. It's a good book. Destiny Thieves. I should point out here how would that one grandson escape after Leah's brain of terror. See how God operates? She's plotting, she's planning for the mind of the bloodline, and she legally sees the throne, and she thought she killed all her grandchildren. But God preserve one. Listen to this. After Leah's own daughter, Jehoshaphat, he and her nephew with the priesthood, all in the plan, for six years in order to reserve the rightful heir to the throne. When you think you got the upper hand against God, God is always stepping ahead of you. Every time you try Put, to put yourself in a position that God has not authorized you to be in. God has the upper hand. Because he knows exactly how to stop you in your track. And sometimes, God will let you do what you want to do to satisfy yourself. 
Then he pulls the wool from off, the, off of your eyes. Pulls the copper from under your feet and calls you to fall. And then you have to come back to a place of repentance and ask God to forgive you. Before Athaliah's seventh year as queen, the priesthood seized the opportunity to establish the prince into their rightful position and secure, secretly aligned the military forces to support him. The priesthood. Now you know what the priesthood is, right? The Levites. In a secret temple ceremony, the child was crowned king. When she thought she cut off the bloodline, God had the upper hand, had a remnant set aside to seize the throne. So the priesthood who follows after the order of Melchizedek, after the order of Abraham, after the order of God, are the very ones who secured the bloodline child to reign as king. When Athaliah heard the people blowing trumpets and celebrating, celebrating the ascension of Joash, the rightful heir to the throne, she tore her clothes and yelled treason. She's mad now. Because she illegally seized the throne. But the bloodline got it according to the, the law. The way God ordained to be in their custom. Jezebel and her seed will always falsely accuse others for what they themselves have done. You hear that? The spirit of Jezebel, Athaliah, Delilah will always bring an accusation against somebody who's walking the right before God. They always look for an opportunity to come into your life, to wreak havoc in your life, to stop you from walking in your purpose. And then to falsely accuse you of something you've never even done. Many times I've been falsely accused of sleeping with other women and doing different things in the church and all the stuff that they said they didn't do. Because of jealousy. Because of envy. Because people want what I got. I'm not a wealthy person in the flesh. But I'm wealthy in the spirit. Because I have all the treasures. And the wisdom. And the knowledge. God has poured into my life. Through a divine order of the Holy Spirit. So I'm wealthy in the kingdom of God. And the devil is mad about it because I don't let his influences control my thought life. So they send people who false accusations to attack you. You, my brother, my sister, the enemy does the same thing. He sends someone along to attack you right where you are so you can stop believing in who God called you to be. I found out something. I heard my pastor say this many times. If you don't know who you are, the devil knows who you are. And the enemy knows the power, he knows the authority, he knows the influence you have against him. But we don't know it because we allow the enemy to put blinders on our eyes. When you put blinders on your eyes, what happens? You can't see. I can't see anything. Because what God's trying to show me, I cannot see it because I'm blinded by my selfish ambitions. When God began to speak this word to me, he says many times when I place a righteous seed inside of us, he said we allow the enemy to smother and suffocate the seed from receiving the nourishment. You know, I have plants. You see my plants behind me. You look in the screen. My plants would never have been productive as the way they are if I never took the time to prune them, to uproot, to repot, take off the dead leaves, take off the dead roots. If I never took the time to nurture my plants, 
The tallest plant behind me is a rubber tree. It started about that little. And the more I nurtured I had for two years now, and that's how far it grew. Because I took the time to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. Because I got a revelation out of plants. Because if you don't take care of what God gives you, they will begin to slowly decay. And if you put too much water, you drown them. And they'll die. God started teaching me as I've been nursing these plants for the last several years. That the more we allow the Spirit of God to pour in us, He pours just an adequate amount of water you need in your spirit. He puts enough substance inside of you to sustain you till you mature enough to take more. You cannot rush the process. I don't care how much I try to tell that place, grow, grow, grow. You got to get taller. You're not tall enough. You should have been taller than this by now. I have no control and no power over those plants. God gave them the ability to do what they do in their season. That's a revelation for somebody. God gives you the enough knowledge, the enough wisdom, the enough resources to do what you need to do in your season. You know when I started this Bible class four years ago, almost five years, I was the only one on here doing this class. And I taught my class as if I had a whole audience before me. Because God told me it's not about you. It's about doing what I command you to do for the kingdom of God. And the more I studied, the more revelation came to me. I'm going to tell you one thing about my, by myself. I don't like reading. I never have. I was poor in my education in high school, poor in middle school, because I would not apply myself to knowledge. Hope you're listening. As I got older, went to Bible college and had to study. I went to Bible college the first time at the age of 19. Dropped out. Didn't care about it. Lived a righteous life. 2011, was introduced to Agape Love Bible class. Got a scholarship for free class. Went a whole year studying. God had to discipline me in order to pass the class. And guess what? I passed with honors. Later on, moved to Texas, went to a dental school. Didn't like to read. Had to read. In order to succeed in this class, to pass exam of the requirements, I had to do something I did not want to do, which was studying. Guess what? I worked second shift. And as I worked, sometimes I wouldn't get off work to 3 or 4 in the morning because my shift relief wouldn't come. And when someone did come and relieve me, they were late coming in, which made me stay at 5 o'clock sometime in the morning. Had to be in class at 8 o'clock in the morning the next day. Which is the next morning. So I'm at work at 5 in the morning and 3 hours later I got to be in class. I was so tired. I was so sleepy. I would go to school anyway, drive myself to school. And I and my school, and, 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 and where I was at, to where I worked at, was about 45 minutes apart. So I had to drive home with about 30 minutes, go home, take a shower, change clothes, go to school. And I had to discipline myself to do this for eight months while going to school. Every month we had an exam. I failed my exam. And the reason why, I was tired from working late in the midnight hours. Getting home sometimes six o'clock in the morning. One time got home at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I, I failed my exams. But thank God I had a godly teacher. A godly professor. 
She says, Mr. Emery, in my class, you know, I have no fail tolerance. And you failed your exam. When you come in tomorrow morning, I want you to come prepared to take this exam again. When I came to school the next morning, she took me to another classroom. Well, I sat by myself, took the exam, and got an A on the exam. Every time I had a second chance to do over, you hear what I'm saying? I passed the exam. So when it came to graduation, I passed on the honor roll. Every quarter, I was on the honor roll. Because God showed me favor because he knew I was tired. I was frustrated. I was aggravated. I felt like saying, forget it. What's the use? And never got a job from the career. But you know what I was so excited about? Even though I applied for jobs as a job as a job, no one gave me a chance. God gave me a revelation. So you may not have accomplished in the natural world a job to be successful in the career. You accomplish in the spirit something you couldn't do for yourself before because you kept telling yourself, I can't do it. Say, so I've proved to you that you have the willpower to do anything you set your mind to do. Tell my joy filled my heart. I was so excited. I was so full of happiness. I was just glad that I made it through a course I didn't think I would have finished. All because I stayed prayed up and trusting God. When you make up your mind to do over sometimes, Sometimes that's the best step to take in life. You might say, well, my relationship is failing or my marriage is failed. My job fired me. My house is in repossession. Uh, in foreclosure, my car in repossession. All these different things are happening to me. How can I do it over? First of all, change your confession. Just because all the stuff looks dark and bleak in your life does not mean it's the end of your life. You still have another chance. Every day you wake up, glory to God, hallelujah. I'm excited now y'all can hear myself. Every time you wake up in the morning, you have the opportunity to do it again. Because God gave you another chance. You might lose your house. God said, ain't in. Might have to file bankruptcy. Because all the debt that became overwhelming. I did bankruptcy three times in my life. And guess what? I did it again. Got over that. Got more credit cards again. Got more debt again. But I'm more manageable in my debt this time. Before I was careless and reckless when God would bless me with credit cards. But I have more control over my debt now than I did before. Because of the wisdom. The word says in Proverbs. You get wisdom. You get understanding. You have to learn how to operate in the kingdom of God, in God's wisdom. Thank God that he preserves a righteous seed, a remnant, to fulfill his perfect will. He didn't say his permissive will. He didn't say it's possible that God might come through for you and, and might get you out of this debt. He might give you another house, he might give you another car, he might give you another marriage, he might give you this, he might give you that. He didn't say that. God preserves a righteous seed for what? Because he has a remnant of people who are not bound out to Baal. Who made a choice and a decisive decision to not give it to the enemy. Through the power of Jezebel. Through the power of Apollonia through the power of Delilah, but who made a decision. I am divinely protected by God from the enemy. Listen to this. We always need to be praying for those seeds of righteousness to be divinely protected from the enemy's plan. You hear that? You might want to write that down. That's something we need to do every day. We, we need to pray. Listen to it. It said pray. Glory to God. I like that. that. That's a good one there. You might want to write that down. 
We always need to be praying for those seeds of righteousness to be divinely protected from the enemy's plan. Just like God got a plan for you, the enemy got a plan for you too. And in his plan, it leads you to hell. In his plan, it causes you to become bankrupt. In his plan, it causes you to become sick, spiritually sick and broken and destitute. I am so tired of God's people Say God bless me and God showed me favor and you living like a pauper. A vagabond. Always begging. Where's your God whom you claim has blessed you and showed you favor? It's time to mature and grow up and stop sucking on the bottle. When God called you out of darkness it's like he took the cane of the spirit and grabbed you. It's like the sheep when they fall into a pit, they take that staff. So that rod and staff, they come for me, right? So God takes that staff with that hook on it to grab you by your neck to pick you up out of the pit. But he does not just pick you up. He cleans you up. He pushes you right back among the sheepfold to preserve you. It's up to you to allow the shepherd to lead, guide, and direct you. The Lord is my shield and my buckler. He's my protector. He's my confidant. He's my healer. He's my redeemer. He's everything I need. If you don't know it for yourself, you'll never recognize the power of God working in your life. You got to get to the place yourself. You stop giving to the voice of the enemy. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. The divine revelation to reshape your thought life. To have the mind of Christ and take out all that garbage, that filth, that junk, that debris out of your mind. Move, remove the cobwebs. You know how a lot of people, I said this before, how a lot of people, they, they have these big old Bibles. I said it in church one Sunday. They got these big old Bibles. And the Bible, it sits in the, in, in the, on the table as a showpiece, collecting dust. Some of them get cobwebs. Because the spiders that came down and landed on it, began to build cobwebs. Your mindset, without it being filled with God, is an area that's exposed to the spiritual cobwebs of the enemy to entrap you. You know how a spider... When they get in the corner of the ceiling, they begin to build a spiral web. And they build it. Sometimes it's real big, sometimes it's small. And a bug comes flying around your house, don't realize that it's there, and it lands in it. What happens? The more they struggle, the more entwined you come in the web. And then the spider comes along gets on the prey, begins to bite the prey and suck out the blood. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin and gave us new life in Christ Jesus. The enemy came along to pervert you from receiving a new life by getting your thought life, to make you doubt God's ability to keep you, doubt God's word to preserve you, and doubt, and doubt God power to control and lead and guide you. So the more you get entangled in the mind of the enemy, read Galatians chapter 5. It talks about the, the, the fruit of the enemy, the fruit of the spirit. And the more you get entwined in the thought life of the enemy, the more he gets you captivated with things that appear to be pleasing to the eyes. Did he do that to Eve? He made the fruit of good and evil to look pleasant for the eyes, desirable to eat, and trick them to eating of the fruit that God told them not to eat of. We do the same thing every day when we turn our minds for walking in God's truth and righteousness. I encourage you tonight. Allow the Lord Jesus Christ 
through the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what it is inside of you that needs to be taken out. You might be prideful, you might be selfish, you might be stingy, you might be haughty, you might be bitter, you might have resentment in your heart, unforgiveness in your heart, hatred in your heart, jealousy in your heart, whatever it is. You got to be real with yourself in order to do over. You can't do things over for the same old pattern. If you got the same pattern, the same system, the same cycle, you're not doing it over. You're stuck in the mindset of an enemy. Defeating Goliath and Athalia. Let's go a little further. Now let's look a little deeper into Athalia's attack on Judah. As stated above, one of the definitions of Judah implies the actions of casting and throwing and indicating conquest. Defeating your enemy. It implies to overpower your enemy. David, even as a young man, understood this prophetic destiny he inherited as a descendant of Judah. He possessed a spiritual DNA to conquer his enemies, and he proved this when at first when he faced unafraid the feared giant Goliath. Who feared Goliath? Saul and his army. Here comes this little shepherd boy. Said the Lord is my shepherd, I should not warrant. He trusts in the shepherd. He believes in his shepherd. His father sent him to take his brothers and the soldiers some food, some bread, and some wine. He goes to take the, the delicacies to them. And they're hiding from Goliath, who's taunting them. Here comes the shepherd boy who says, Who is this that defiles the living God of Israel? And they said Goliath because he taunted them. He threatened them. Then he began to threaten David. You come to me with, with, a, with, with little, little stones and all this stuff. And he said, I got a javelin. I got a sword. He said, you going to come against me? <laughs> Who do you think you are? I'm a conqueror. I trained for battle. David never was trained for battle in the natural standpoint, but he was trained when God allowed him to protect his sheep. That's how he learned how to defeat an army. Was learning how to protect his sheep. He never faced a real battle with people until this moment when he presented himself before the armies of Israel. And God began to give him wisdom and a strategy and God told him, go to the creek and get five smooth stones. So I'm going to lead you to victory over your enemy. And you're going to cut off his head with his own sword. Everything God said, David obeyed the voice of God. Because in his spirit was a conqueror. There was a king in him, a giant in him, who stood as tall as Goliath. And had the power and the ability to overcome his enemy. Inside of him was a determination not only to fulfill his destiny, but also to establish praise in a future tabernacle, all for the word of God. He proved his first, his, this first encounter, but not being afraid of the enemy. What enemy is talking to you tonight? What enemy has you in fear tonight? Is it cancer? Is it high blood pressure? Is it diabetes? Is it sickle cell? Is it brain tumors? Is it skin cancer? Whatever your disease is, whatever that enemy is in your life that got you fearing, where's your faith? Do you have faith the size of a mustard seed? To speak to your mouth and command it to move? Or do you have the faith to run away? I heard a pastor say today that God has not given you the ability to throw in your burdens and run away. You have to make a decision 
whatever burden on your shoulder to trust God to remove it. If God chooses not to remove it, trust that God is there to go with you through it. Paul says, sought the Lord three times to remove a thorn in my flesh. And God's response was, my grace is sufficient. Then Paul came to the realization that if his grace is sufficient, then I'd rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Because he said it was a messenger of Satan that came to buffet him, to cause fear, to abandon his faith. But he learned how to turn towards the Lord. Remember how David carefully selected five smooth pebbles as his weapons, while the huge Philistine heard intimid hurled intimidating threats, mocking David's age and size, the young boy remained focused for the battle. Focus 2020. Where's your focus? I'm not talking about the natural eyesight, the spiritual eyesight. Where's your focus? Do you have focus to defeat your Goliath and Athaliah in your life? Or do you have fear to run and hide in terror? Without hesitation, he continued to gather five smooth stones for his sling. David knew he was a servant of the Most High God. He was a praiser. He knew how to give God all the glory. He might have been young, but he knew he was chosen. Do you know you're chosen? Do you know that God handpicked, selected you for such a time as this? Place a particular calling on your life for the kingdom of God? To do exploits for his kingdom? To silence the voice of the enemy with your words through the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you know you're chosen? Are you a praiser? Your praise, Judah, Judah's wealth, the lion of Judah defeats the enemy in our lives. But we have to know in ourselves that I have the Lion of Judah living inside of me that I have the power to overcome any obstacle. This is what the enemy does to us. As we select our weapons of warfare, we carefully plan, strategize, and seek weapons of prayer, strategies to defeat after leader, while the enemy hurls false accusations towards us, attempting to intimidate us. You hear that? Enemy wants to intimidate you. He wants you to be fearful. He wants you to think you don't have the power to overcome him. He wants you to think you can't overcome that stronghold in your heart. He wants you to think you can't break that bad habit. So he intimidates you to make you think this is the normal way of living. Listen to me. Keep possession of our inheritance. That means stay focused. There's an inheritance for you and for I in the kingdom of God. But we have to stay focused. Set your affections on things that are above and not on the earth. Where Christ is seated in the heavenly places in the heavenly realm. You got to change your focus. If we listen to him, talking about the enemy, if we listen to the enemy's voice, we will back off from the battle. Didn't Saul do that in his army? They hid from the battle. Even though they were facing the enemy, the opposing forces, they did not find in themselves the strength to defeat the enemy. Even Moses sent the spies out to go spy the Canaan land. Joshua and Caleb only came out of the 12 spies that said we are more able to overcome the enemy. The rest of them came back and said the enemies look like giants with our eyes. We look like grasshoppers. They were intimidated. And yet, Joshua and Caleb says, you know what? Moses, we can do this. They have encouraged everybody else to follow suit for the victory. 
David did not listen to Goliath. He kept focusing on the victory. We should do the same. We should do the same every day of our life. We should set our focus on the victory. Set your focus on the victory. When you set your focus on the victory, that's when you see God showing you the victory to overcome. But you got to want the victory. God can't force the victory on you. He can show you how to engage in a battle. He can give you the strategies to overpower your enemy. He can also tell you he already defeated the enemy. But you got to believe it by faith. There's some battles we have to fight. There's some battles we don't need to fight. But the battle we have to fight every day, you know what it is? The mind. The battlefield of the mind. We got to get to the place we recognize, we acknowledge, we understand our opponent. We know our enemy in our mind. And allow the Holy Spirit, just like he did with David, to allow us not to be intimidated through the thoughts of other people who speak for your demise, who bring accusations and lies about you, make you stop believing in yourself, to become, to teach you to become spiritual suicidal. We got to know for ourselves. If I keep my focus, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I got to keep moving forward. Stop looking backwards. Why five stones? David must have believed that he might have to take all of them to defeat his enemy. He must have thought that if one or two did not do the trick, it would be prudent to have a few more. Ain't that something? It's a possibility. Also, Goliath had four brothers. In faith, David could slay Goliath with the first stone and the other four for the retaliation, the brothers. Similarly, we need several plans in prayer to overthrow our Goliath. Being prepared with an arsenal of weapons is using wisdom. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the putting down of strongholds. You gotta recognize the arsenal of weapons that God is giving you. Biblically, the number five represents grace. We know that. Atonement, life, the cross. And the fivefold ministry. But the number five also represents five I wills of Satan. When Satan threatened to ascend above God's throne, his divine authority, he said, I will five times. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. So choosing five stones, David also overpowering the I wills of Goliath. These five I will sign it like I will feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. I will feed you to the beasts of the fields. I will certainly defeat you. All you have is a stick to war with. Remember, David had his staff. So he had a slingshot and the five stones. That's why Goliath was talking. He said, You come with sticks and stones? He said, I will defeat you. You're too young to be a warrior. I will utterly destroy you. No one that pretty could be a real man. And that's something. He knew what David was and what he looked like, so he wanted to taunt him to make him doubt who he was. 1 Samuel 17th chapter, verse 41 to 44. Prayer, prayer phase. As you gather your weapons of warfare, what five I wills is Satan hurling at you? Maybe he's speaking lies such as, I will kill you. I will destroy your marriage. I will steal the lives of your children. I will take all your possessions. I will never allow you to be free. Five I wills of the enemy. 
Him, he wants the bloodline. He wants your children. He wants your marriage. He wants your descendants. He wants your home. He wants everything you have. Jim wants the path to victory begins at the cross of Jesus. Realizing that he paid the price for your deliverance is the first step toward possessing every promise and defeating each Goliath. Most of us know David's story and his ending. God honored the young man and his faith. After all, he is a God who honors faith. 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 Do you get it in your spirit? Even more, he is a covenant God who gave his word that the tribes of Judah would rule and reign over his enemies. The same promise is yours today. What are you going to believe? David was the one who just happened to believe it and do it. Are you like David tonight? Do you have the willpower, the desire, the heart to overcome and defeat Goliath in your life? Or is Goliath defeating you? My nose keeps it. I don't know why my nose keeps it. Allergies. Do you have the power to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you with your arsenal to overpower the enemies in your life? It might be relationship enemies. It might be acquaintances. It might be associates. People who, who hang around you who's plotting and planning for your demise and, and talking about behind your back, backstabbers who want to take your place And God is trying to warn you, but because you're not listening, you fall prey and become a victim. David's destiny, you hear this? David's destiny involved slaying Goliath, running from Saul, and keep becoming king of all Israel, which included Judah, and planted a tabernacle of praise. But even more than this, Christ was born from David's lineage. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory bless his name. The spirit motivated Athaliah to destroy her generation was also targeting the generation of David in order to destroy the line of Judah. That's what the enemy wants to do. Wants to destroy your generations. That's coming after you. It's up to you to make a decision from this day forward. I have the willpower to do over the way God wants me to live my life, the way God wants me to walk in this life, the way God wants me to be a blessing in this life, the way God wants to use me in this life. I have a desire to be able to surrender to His will and plan His purpose for my life. Allow him to be the orchestrator of my life. Only God can do what he promised to do for you. If you're willing to let go of yourself, allow the Holy Spirit to empower you. So as we come to a close tonight, I pray that God ministers to your heart and bring conviction. Just like he convicts me to change and become better. He does the same thing with you in your heart. Convicts you to want to do better. Stop being selfish. Stop being stingy. Share the word of God. Preach the gospel. Walk in your calling. Walk in your purpose. So seeds in people's lives. The church folk are so selfish. Most church folks are so selfish they won't even give a dime to help nobody if they pass along the street. The Lord says, He called us to be blessed to be a blessing. But we don't walk in it because we're selfish. What's mine is mine. I'm going to keep mine for myself. But I found out, as the Word of God says,
God should give. Give not gradually or necessity. God, for God loves a cheerful giver. No, only day he said, you give, it's going to come back to you again. Press down, shaking together, running over, to me give it to your bosom. All because it's a covenant we have to be a blessing to somebody else. We have to learn to walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit and walk in integrity, walk in your character. As you claim to be a minister of God, walk in it. Don't be a counterfeit minister. Don't be a camouflage Christian. Don't be a lying deceiver. Walk in your purpose for purpose because you've been created in the will of God on purpose. So I charge you tonight. Allow the Lord to touch your heart to be a giver to somebody that you pass along your journey. You may never sow into my life financially, but you might sow wisdom, might sow word. We can always give something. People always think it's about money. He never said in his word about giving money and it come back to you. He's talking about your heart and your attitude. Whatever you give to bless somebody else along your journey, he said they're going to come back to you. Press down, shake together, run it over. Shall men give it to your bosom? See, people haven't been taught right. They only been taught and manipulated to give money for the pastor's gain. Even though the churches need money, it has an appropriate place for where it needs to be. But God wants us to have the attitude of Jesus Christ. He gave everywhere he went into someone's life to help change their life and change their destiny. What are you doing? Who are you impacting along your journey? Who are you pointing to? Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart, to bring a change in your attitude, even in your conversation. If you are one that always doubt and kept speaking negatively over yourself and over someone else, allow the Holy Spirit to wash your mouth with the water of the Word. And through the words of life and not words of death. So, Father, tonight I thank you for this message. I pray, oh God, it convicts all of our hearts to do better. Cleanse us, change us, empower us. Give us your desires to want to live for you, oh God. To stop being fake and counterfeit. To be real with ourselves, oh God. In areas of our life we know we haven't been living right, God. Help us to be real and face the consequences. There's punishment for your sin. You said the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Help us to repent. Acknowledge our wrongdoings. Lay it on the altar that you come into our heart and cleanse us. And purify our hearts and our conversation. That our mouths, the words in our mouth be seasoned with salt and with grace. That we speak the word of God over somebody we need to encourage, to edify, to strengthen, and build them up in their faith, oh God. To draw them to Jesus Christ. That you will be glorified. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I do each week. Would you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, known and unknown sins, and the cleansing of all unrighteousness. I thank you for giving me another chance to do things right. Come into my heart. And be my Lord and Savior. And I receive you tonight, God, as my Lord and my King. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you don't know Jesus and you just prayed that simple prayer tonight, you just got born again. And the Holy Spirit 
has written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that made the decision to give their life over to Jesus Christ. Amen. So I charge you today. Excuse me. I charge you tonight to share the love of God. To walk by faith and not by sight. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct you in God's plan, God's will, and God's purpose. It's not about your agenda. Not about your list of things you want God to do. It's not your plan, but His will to be done in your life. I guarantee when you do this, you will find yourself experience joy like never before in your heart. And a peace will come over you like never before, cause you to be able to rest in His presence. So I encourage you to love the Lord Jesus to convict you, to reprove you, to make you better as a steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I charge you to study the word of God, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, and rightly divide the word of truth. For Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles, and also the uttermost parts of the world. That's when you find a love affair. A genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. When you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you all be encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. Stay in your word. Pray, 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 and pray again. Until your life change for the better. And watch God change things. Pray for others. Encourage others. Motivate others. Share the gospel. The drama of the Christ. And watch God change your life. Because of your obedience. Anybody got any questions before we go tonight? Amen. Again, I thank you all for tuning in tonight. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord lift his counsels upon you and give you peace. Until next week, God bless you all. Shalom. Have a good night. Amen.